Bibles, grab, dig in, and find Acts 2, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, fifth book in, Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. A few weeks ago, I shared on um, apostolic movement and what an apostle, what that really looks like for us in today's world. And I talked to you guys about kingdom culture versus world culture. And what in the world is Shell Lakeville Gospel here for? And why are we on this piece of property? And why are you people here in this? Like, why did God bring you specifically to this place at this time? And what is our assignment that God has for us? And we talked about the difference between world culture and kingdom culture. World culture is like your job, the team you're part of, the family you're part of, the nationality that you are, your hobbies, even your church family. Our churches can very easily have a subculture, like we're like a culture in, our, in ourselves, which is not necessarily the kingdom culture. One of, my, one of my kids were volleyball players, my girls, I was in this little subculture of volleyball parents where we like helped with the fundraising and we went to all the games and did all of that. And it was our own little culture, our own little world. I got to know people and hung out with people and were, I was influenced and hopefully influenced people in this little subculture. So we all have these subcultures that we're involved in, not necessarily like it's a bad thing, like world culture is bad. It's just the culture of our world. And there's a lot of subcultures. But what's real easy is for the church to become a subculture versus being part of the kingdom culture, the culture that God has for us to build the kingdom of God to lead others to him. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, I want to read this scripture to you first of all, just to show you what kingdom culture looks like a little bit. Here's the first church that was ever developed in the New Testament here, Acts 2, 42 through 47 says this. All the believers devoted themselves, let me just preface this by saying, Jesus has died, he's been raised from the dead, he's been ascended into heaven, and then the people, the disciples, and a remnant of people went and they gathered in the upper room. The Holy Spirit falls on them, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, or with the Holy Ghost, and it's a new day, and the church is birthed. The new church is birthed. And then we read, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to pray. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place, shared everything they had, they sold their property and possessions, and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared their meals with great joy and, and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Amen. What a beautiful picture of the church. Amen. It's a culture. And everyone that was added was brought into that culture of building the kingdom. So it, I just wanted to give you a little picture of kingdom culture versus world culture. World culture is not bad, but it does pull and there's tension away from the kingdom culture. So all of us, every person, every human being on earth is either directing culture or following culture in different areas of our life. We're either influencing or we're being influenced, one or the other. I was influenced in my volleyball culture because I felt guilted into being in the popcorn stand whether I wanted to or not. It was like shame if you didn't. Oh, you're that parent. No. But we are, we are being influenced or we are influencers in culture, subcultures, and we have to decide, are we going to be kingdom culture shapers? Are we going to direct culture, which includes the community and lifestyles and values? So we're either making an impact or sometimes the world is making impact on us, both which are not bad. I'm not saying it's bad to have the world give impacts on us. It's good. But is it the best? So you see, we can't be a subculture as a church and, and then have kingdom culture being birthed out of us. We can grow our subculture, but if we're going to grow the kingdom of God, we have to have a church, a church family, the, the church, court, not just like Shelley Gospel, but the church. We have to have a focus that says we are, 
we are investing and we are shaping kingdom culture, which includes in our jobs, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our nationalities, in our hobbies, whether you're a quilter or you're a car collector or you're a fisherman or whatever it is, but it's for the kingdom culture we're investing it in. I want to read Isaiah 9, 2, and then also Ephesians 5, 8, talking about the light. Isaiah 9, 2 says this, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, is a, a light has dawned. And then Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. I'm going to give you a really quick analogy. It's kind of hokey. I probably did this for youth many, many years ago, although I think we used candles, so it was a little cooler. Now they probably use their iPhones, but let me try something here. Okay, so there's a culture. There's darkness and there's light. There's a realm of reality that is darkness. Would you agree? There is a, it's a true reality that is darkness. And then there's a reality that is light, which is the Lord. It's, it's through God. So there's these two realities that are going on that are affected and connected into our cultures. And now we are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. So we are the light. So the Lord is saying we've got, to, we've got to shine our lights. We have to be influencers. We need to rise up and impact and help shape culture and where we're going. So now there's a remnant. Let's, now I'm, there's the church as a whole, but I'm just tonight going to talk about like us here, this group right here. Ten of you are like, you know what, God? I am all in. Everything for you. Everything for you. Now, darkness, the, the reality of darkness is here on earth. But now, what happens when a light comes on? What does it do? It pushes back darkness, right? But it's still a little dark in here. There's still areas of darkness. And the more people that rise up and wake up and come alive in Christ in every venue of life, in every culture of life, whether it's business or academics or this, like sciences or um, families and parenting or fine, what, whatever it is, the more we come alive and we start to shine our light. Amen. Darkness is a reality. And the only thing that pushes away darkness is... And the more we shine our lights... And the more of us that commit, uh oh, my light's not shining all the way. There we go. <laughs> and the more of us that gather and say, I'm in, Lord, I'm in, Lord, the less dark there is. Amen. Darkness is still trying to invade this room right now. And if we quit shining our light, it's here. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. It's here. Yes. But when we shine, we create space. I used to tell the kids, and when we were in uh, youth ministry, I used to tell the kids, when you walk through the doors of your school, you don't even have to open your mouth. That's right. You're a walking light, and there's darkness going on in your school, and there's broken hearts, and there's bondages, and there's fears, and there's misunderstanding of their identity. But when you walk in a room, there's light. That's right. And whatever, guys, whatever space you walk into, when you are all in, when you are going after God, and you're saying, let me be a light, you are pushing back darkness. Yes, That's right. Amen. You're pushing back darkness That's at your meetings, at your doctor appointments, at your school meetings, mm -hmm. your coffee dates. You're pushing it back if you're a light. Yes. Surrendered hearts equal spirit-led lives. Spirit-led lives are filled with agape love. Pastor Rick shared about that on Wednesday night about love. Love is the key. Romans 12, if you have your Bible, you can look at verses 1 and 2. This is going to be our, our scripture to memorize this week. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. A little later tonight, we're going to dig into them.
I'm reading from the NLT. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And I know I've said this probably every time I ever speak in front of everybody, that I love to take all the different versions and read them all. And um, it's just, I think it's kind of fun. Some of them are a little crazy. I wouldn't like stake my life on them <laughs> or my theology on them, but they're just, it's interesting. I just want to read to you Romans 12 from the Message Bible. Just interesting. Listen to how they put it. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, your ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into without even thinking. Yeah. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Just an interesting thing. So, praying about how... It, this leadership track and where God wants us to go and I came across the story I don't know how but just the story of Daniel came to mind and the Daniel anointing and so I started to study the book read it and you read it and then you read it and then you read it in different versions and read it some more and chew on it I read the scripture on Sunday but let's read it real quick Daniel 5:12. Daniel is the one who was in the lion's den. Daniel's good buddies are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are in the fiery furnace. A lot of different stories. It's a great book, just full of stories. Great to read with your kids, by the way, you guys. Lots of adventure and lots of amazing God stuff that happens. Daniel 5.12 says this. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. Now the king is looking for, there's a handwriting, a hand has come down and wrote some stuff on a wall that nobody understands, and he's looking for someone who has like special powers who can figure out what that is. And all the magicians and soothsayers and fortune tellers come and they can't figure it out and so they they call up Daniel if you call for Daniel he'll tell you what the writing means because there's this reputation with Daniel that he can solve difficult problems that no one else can solve and they say it's because of the God within him okay. he's filled with divine knowledge and understanding and so as I read that it just caught with me Lord if we're going to shape culture we can't just be smart people because there's a lot of smart people. And I hate to tell you this, but there's someone smarter than each one of you in the room. And there's someone who's a better nurse than you, and a better teacher than you, and a better parent than you, and a better business person than you, and a better musician than you. There's always somebody better. There's, there's, it's just how it is, as far as a skill or whatever. We can't measure ourselves that way. We have to measure ourselves according to what God has for us. And then there's somebody who maybe doesn't have quite the skill that we have of something. We all have our areas, our little niche of where we're like, we're the best. No one could do what we can do. It's just us. God's like, this is for Jen. No one else can do what Jen can do. So what we have to have, the difference in us, is the Daniel anointing. The Daniel anointing is an understanding that goes beyond my understanding and is only brought on by this Holy Spirit. You have to have communion with the Holy Spirit to have the Daniel anointing. You can't pray it in. You can't like ask God to give it to you like it's a gift and here you go. It's something that is developed and I have to say like earned in this day where we don't really want to talk about works, but it's something that's earned. 
the Daniel anointing is. Mm -hmm. It's something you have to do. It's not like a, I don't know, I remember I watched a, a testimony from someone who knew nothing about music and someone laid hands on him, prophesied and said, you're gonna be a phenomenal piano player. And the person, this guy went and sat down at the piano and from that day on was just like ridiculous and full of anointing. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> He's like, no oh, practice, Jen. <laughs> Take some lessons, Jen. There's a price for this anointing. So how did Daniel receive this anointing? I'm going to give you three points. One, two, and three. The first point is Daniel refused to compromise to culture. Number one, Daniel refused to compromise to culture. So, um, all of the, the Jewish boys and different, different actually it was all the like good looking buff guys that, they, that the king brought in to, that was going to serve in his palace. And they were all put on this really rich diet, like they got to eat a magnificent food. But Daniel, his belief, he was a Jew, they didn't eat meat and they didn't eat rich foods. And so this wasn't, like we know a Daniel fast, we're like, we're going on a fast, we're doing the Daniel fast. But actually it was just a cult, like it's just what Daniel did, it was like how they lived in that day. I'm not saying it wasn't fast, but for us it's a fast because we're like, where's my meat? But. <laughs> But the Daniel Fest was just a way of life. It was a culture. It was part of who they were as the Jewish people. It's how they partook of their food. And so all of this richness laid out for him. And he says, I'm so sorry to the guy who's the overseer of these young men. He says, I need to eat only what I can eat according to the law of Jehovah. And his, the overseer says, well, we really can't do that because I need all you guys to look good and I need you to look healthy and to be strong. And Daniel says, well, give me, is it 10 days or 10 weeks? I can't remember. It's 10. 10 days? Because I went, oh, look at that, 10. 10 days. He says, let me eat the way I eat. Let me follow my culture, Jehovah's culture for me, for 10 days, and let's just see the difference. Well, at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his buddies um, are all, they all, they're better, they're healthier, they're stronger, they're, it says they're more alert, they're sharp than the other guys that are being held in captive. And so they end up changing the diet. So everybody needs the Daniel, like the Daniel fest that we would call today. Would you say that shaped culture? It did. Daniel refused to compromise to culture. He kept the Jewish diet today. What does that look like? Well, I don't know. Is it books? Is it music? Is it TV? Is it schedules? Is it priorities? Is it values? The diet that the other, that, that nation was on, was it sinful? No, it was their culture. Our culture is, when you're in the King's Palace, you get to eat like this. Like when you come to the Slaters, we have a culture of how we eat. Anybody agree? <laughs> we like meat, don't we, baby? <laughs> we love food. There's a culture. There's a way of that we eat. And then there's another way that Pastor A. Reg eats. And it's a different culture. It's very healthy. <laughs> very disciplined. <laughs> like, don't you want a big yummy piece of warm bread? Be like, for real doesn't. Like, Don can make it and he won't eat it. That's like, I, I don't know what kind of culture that is. <laughs> no, anyway... Sorry, getting off track here. But all of these things, it's not necessarily like uh, a book is bad. There's a book that's a really neat book out there that's being read. It's a real hot book. It's a bestseller. It's not that it's a bad thing, but what are you feeding yourself? Like, what are you nurturing yourself with? Uh, but that's the thing. What are you nurturing yourself with? What's the thing that's sustaining you? Or what is the thing that's taking you from the culture God asked you to walk in? True. Yeah. I'm filling myself with world culture, not sin. World culture, not wrong to get smarter. It's not wrong to have entertainment. But is it? does it fill me? Is it what motivates me? Is it what moves me? Is it the thing that triggers my ideas and my answers for life? Is that what triggers it? Or is it 
what I have fed myself from the kingdom culture that triggers my solutions, triggers my ideas, triggers my visions, triggers my dreams. Big difference. Big difference. Dan, number one, Daniel refused to compromise to culture. So he kept, he lived a holy life, which is basically what that means is set apart. And Krista came in today and she's like, yeah, set apart, dedicated to a righteous cause. And I was like, oh, I got to write that down. Holy, a holy life looks like it's set apart, dedicated to a righteous cause. It does not mean better than others. Get that, please. It does not mean I live a holy life and I'm better than others. Living a holy life is for our own well-being, our protection, so that we might protect and care for and love others while glorifying God in all that we do. That's what a holy life is for. Yeah. It's to produce fruit. Right. Honor God and produce fruit. Yes. Yeah. That's right. If our holy life brings condemnation, or we feel a little better than, that's not holy. That's just called works. So number one is Daniel refused to compromise the culture. Number two, Daniel lived a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. And that wasn't the Daniel fast. It was like legit, like... I shouldn't say legit, but like real fasting, like the food thing. Fasting and prayer. There's a verse in chapter 9 where um, it says that Daniel fasted and prayed, and then a vision came to him. Fasting bring your heart, brings your heart before that burning bush of God's presence. That's what fasting will do, fasting and prayer. It brings you to that place for burning bush experiences where there's real God encounters, when you empty yourself and shed things off. You position yourself to receive something from God because you've made space. It's, true. Amen. it's putting down your humanity, like setting some stuff of your humanity aside for God to put something in to your humanity and to feed your spirit. So number one is he refused to compromise to culture. And number two, Daniel lived a lifestyle of fasting and prayer. And then number three is Daniel sought after revelation. So many of us want a great revelation from God, but we're not willing to fast or pray or seek God. We want a quick prayer and give me an answer. We're not really willing to spend the time with the one who releases the revelation. We just want the revelation. Time spent with God gives you intimacy or a real knowledge of His. Yeah. Time with Him then develops and births a surrendered heart because you can obey God, but you cannot surrender to God unless you know God and you trust God. That's right. yeah. You can't surrender to something. You can obey something without trusting. Just you can follow the law, but you cannot surrender. Like, let go, like, really let go, unless you trust. And you can't trust if you don't know somebody or something. And when you have live a surrendered life, pursuing after Christ, then the release of revelation comes. And let me tell you the difference. This is just a really good sidebar about revelation. A lot of us will say we've had a revelation. I have. But if that revelation doesn't transform, literally transform your life, it's really just information gathered. Right. It's, true. Mm -hmm. right. it's just information. I can tell you God loves you like, I can tell you over and over and over and over again that God loves you. But until you get a real revelation of the love of the Father for you, it won't change your life. Amen. And you'll be shook by the next wave that comes in your life or the next person who's rotten to you or the next person who says something snarky to you. It'll take your value away just like that. But when you have a true revelation of the love of God for you and your value in God, it transforms your life. So if you think you've had some revelations, ask yourself, has it literally transformed my life? Did something shift? Did something change? The other thing that we like to do is we like to hear about other people's revelation. This is me. I've done this. 
And I love other people's revelation. I don't think it's ever bad to share revelation, but that doesn't transform my life more often than not either. I'm just like, that's powerful. That is so good. That is so good. But where you're changed is you and Jesus and a supernatural revelation that shifts your world. Shifts your world. Shifts your thinking. Shifts your paradigm. Like, and it's just for you. So other people's revelation are not bad. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't hear or share revelations. But true revelation, personal revelation, will transform your life. Otherwise, it's just information gathered. Do you know God loves everyone the same? There's not one of you who's loved more by God than anybody else. But he has intimate ones. It's true. You guys. God has people that he's very intimate with. Yep. He's not intimate with everybody because they haven't spent time with them. But he loves every single person in this room unbelievably. But he wants to be intimate with you. But you have to pay the price of time and a life surrender. You, you have to dig in and you have to press into him to know him. So the results of Daniel's anointing was that he was had a spirit fell or spirit, excuse me, spirit led life. So when he was in the right place at the right time, God could use him to shape culture. His anointing saved his own life. His anointing saved other people's lives. Because of his anointing, he was elevated to higher positions in the natural world. Not just in the spiritual world, but in the natural world, he was elevated to higher positions because of his anointing. Not because he was an amazing guy, but because of his anointing. And because of his anointing, he shaped culture into kingdom culture. That's the results of having the Daniel anointing. But we have this pressure of taking the time and really good things, Pastor Greg said on Wednesday night, there's a lot of good things, but it's not necessarily the best. And the good things rob us of the best. And the best is Jesus. Bottom line. We close your eyes. Lord, we are going to just take a minute to hear your voice. We're going to ask you to speak to our parts personally. Daniel, Daniel we pass these out. I'm going to pass out some papers. I, we're just going to put some music on. We're going to take five minutes to just have a moment with God personally, and then we'll go to our groups. We're going to actually have some minutes, and we'll go to our groups. But I want to give you guys, so Lord, when I was praying for this night, the Lord said to say this. I know we're a little distracted from the papers, but will you listen for just a minute? The Lord said this for this group. He knew who would be sitting in these beautiful pink chairs tonight. And he said this, my child, I have saved you. I have spared you for such a time as this. I know some things that he has spared me from. Sometimes I forget when I get out of my life. He says to you, I have kept my hand on you, and I have intervened in your life over and over. I have called you, and I have anointed you. Many times I have whispered truths to your heart, time and time again. Listen. Come 
deeper in me. Don't stay where you've been. I'm inviting you to so much more if you're willing to just say yes. I'm inviting you to so much more if you're willing to say yes. We're gonna take a couple minutes. Look at your paper. If you don't wanna fill it out now, you don't have to, you can just pray. But this is something I want you to keep with you for your Bible, with your Bible for the next 10 weeks. I want you to remind yourself, read through this, remind yourself of it. So let's just take a little bit of time. Each night as we finish our teaching, we're going to break into groups at the tables and we'll have a time of discussion and a time of ministry. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to grow in the area of ministering to one another in a way where we stop and we quiet ourselves and we listen for what God has to say. It's never wrong to say, I've got a sick niece, I've got this happening, I've got happening, could you pray for me? There's real power in that, where we pray for one another. But what we're wanting to do on this 10-week journey is we're wanting to quiet ourselves, listen to what the Lord might have to say, and then love each other through encouragement. Maybe like as we are quieting ourselves and we're praying like we're praying for Ray, the Lord might just, a, a random verse might pop in my heart, like, I just want to share a verse with you. Or Ray, I saw this in your life and it really blessed me, like a word of encouragement. So Dan's going to come up and share. And tonight, instead of doing it at all the different tables individually, we're going to just model it. We're going to have a time of ministry here together for tonight. And then next week we'll start by doing it at the tables. Don't freak out if it's something you're not familiar with. You're not going to be required <laughs> to like start prophesying. <laughs> but it's a great way for us to grow together in hearing God's voice. Would you agree? So go ahead. Sunday night, Pastor Rick said there was something very special that this church has for this community. And if we were removed from this community, it would be lacking, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the yeah. power gifts. We believe yeah, in right. the speaking in tongues. We believe in the healings. And it's something we operate in a church. But if we don't ever step into it as an individual, mm -hmm. if we don't use it in our church, we're not going to use it in the world. So what we want to do is we want to set up a safe way to practice this. Now, it's okay to practice. It's okay to practice hearing uh, the Holy Spirit speak to you. It's okay yeah. to practice. God knows who you are. He knows right. you're, as an individual, He knows your fears. He knows what's going on in your life. Um, he doesn't say, like, this one is better. You know, like Pastor Ray, he will pull, call you out and he will speak into your life a God-spoken word. But I can tell you, of a man 15 years ago, or even 20 years ago, that ran for the corner. <laughs> if you knew Pastor Ray 20 years ago, even though he was coming into the church, he ran for the corner. And when I first met him, he would avoid any contact with people. So it's a matter of understanding who you are in Christ. So if you say, I'm a child of God, and that he loves me, you're not a lesser. I'm praying for a missionary right now. He's teaching people that believe that they are lesser. We are not the lessers. That's right. So what we want to do is we want to set up a circle of success. So, I mean, there are times that the Holy Spirit speaks to us in many different ways. But this circle of success is we're only going to speak edifying words which means you're not going to speak correction. That's good. The Lord gives you something to speak to somebody and it's correction. You've got, to, you've got to weigh it in your head. This is how you learn to hear the Holy Spirit. You don't speak correction, or you don't speak prophetically to the future. God does both those things, but we're not going to do that. 
if God gives you something that you feel is that you come and talk to Pastor Ray or Jen or myself, and then we'll talk about it. But we want to set up a place where we can practice it, and it is a safe environment for everybody and that we can all learn. Now, here's the thing. Everybody in here is a believer in Jesus Christ. You have the ability to hear the Holy Spirit and to speak it out. You have that ability, whether you believe it or not. So if you want to step into that, we want to give you a circle to where you're able to do that. But just remember those parameters. I'm a child of God. He wants to use me. I'm not going to speak correction. You might be mad at somebody, and I just want to get them. You're bad. Yeah, you're bad. You did this to me, so I'm going to get you. And that's not the Holy Spirit. That's Dan Slater. Um, and we're not going to speak into the future, no matter how clear and beautiful it is. You can come and talk to leadership, and then we can go from there. Um, a lot of churches have gotten away from this, the beautiful things that God has for us, because people have abused it. Thus, they are so, Lord, I got something for you. God speaks to me only. Is that intimidating or what? And that's not what it's about. Just like Jenna said earlier, she said earlier that God loves us all. And intimacy comes with your desire for intimacy with him. Um, so that's what we want to set up. So I'm going to ask somebody to come up for prayer. Do we have a volunteer? Got a volunteer? Daniel? Oh, no, go ahead, Liza. Liza, I'm here. And um, there's, a few people that, there's a few people that have done this with us quite often, like Gordy, he's been with us in this, and some of the other people. If you've ever done this with us, come on up. My Sherry. Yeah. Yep. Um, Sherry, you know. This isn't, this isn't like I'm picking out the cream of the crop. This is just, uh, I know that they've done this with the young adults before, so this is something that we can, uh, just to give you an example. And when you come up to pray, you know, immediately you got to say to yourself, okay, God, what do I want to say? It's not that. What you got to say to yourself is, Lord, do you have something for me to speak to Liza? Now, if he gives you nothing, don't make it's nothing okay. up. <laughs> There's nothing worse than you fabricating something. Absolutely, because you are going to, you have a really good chance of messing someone's life up. A lot of people have left the church because people had to make something up to make themselves think that they were holy. Yeah, no. yeah. And we don't do that. We don't do that. God is a gentleman. He will speak into someone's life in a beautiful way. And he will use his people that are surrendered to him in a beautiful way. So in a setting like this, you want to prepare yourself. Father, give us something for us. We want to edify her and build her up in the yeah. God, use me as a humble tool that you can use. Lord, clear my mind of all my my pressures and my thoughts and just speak through me, Jesus. Yeah. Speak through me, Jesus. Let me bless her. Let me bless the kingdom because it's all for your glory anyways. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a, a prayer that you should say anytime you're going to talk to somebody. Yeah. And when you go to work, Lord, use me today at work, however that looks. I'm not going to fabricate something. I'm not going to make something up. But if there's a timing and a purpose, don't let me miss it. Yes. Don't let me miss it yes. to further your glory, yes. your precious name. So that's all there is to it. You clear your mind, you ask God to use you, and then you just be wise about what you're going to say. So in other words, you don't, when the Lord speaks something to you, you don't have to go into trembling. You don't have to, uh, uh, thus saith the Lord. You don't have to do that stuff. <laughs> what you have to do is be obedient. And when he says something to you, speak what he says to you. Yes. And here's the thing, because we've set the parameters of no um, correction and no uh, prophetic to the future, you're safe. And so you stay in that. Stay in those parameters in your mind. And you can think to yourself, okay, I think that someone's saying that Liza's going to have five more kids. False prophet. So I've had people come up and say, you know, now I gotta get moving here. You know, you're supposed to marry so and so. I had one guy tell me that he was told he was supposed to marry somebody. He looked at me and says, I don't like her. I said, No, you don't. Yeah. So that person has gotten carried away. Yeah. All right. You ready? <laughs> Gotta love it. Thank you, Jesus. All right, we're gonna pray. Everybody, let's all pray. And if anybody else has something, they. Yeah, this is not just them. If the Lord speaks something to you, speak it out. Because this is.